Israel to keep, uh, uh, I mean, annex to Israel the major uh, settlements, the ones that are cities actually. But the smaller ones, the Palestinian Authority offered that they can either leave or live under Palestinian sovereignty and Palestinian rule. And I mean, but these offers are all in paper because Israel never actually accepted any peace plan, any peace plan. I think it's really difficult um, for people in the United States to understand what it's like to live under occupation. I mean, if they told us, if there was a foreign country who would had troops in our land and told us you cannot go from this state to Chicago without getting a, a passport from us and we're not going to give you one anyhow uh, or if we ever do it'll take months to get there. How would we feel about that? How would we feel if people moved into our land and put up a wall and said, you are on this side and you're not allowed to come over here, even though that was my land before, how would they feel um, with so many of their, our people being in prison for protesting and standing against this occupation? I think it, it you know, when we talk about it, 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 it tends to be almost abstract, but it's in the daily living that I, I, I think that it, where is the self-determination? Where is the ability for people to, to be themselves? What are your hopes? Um, I really hope that Palestinian people can be able to um, return to their lands because, um, and because Palestinians um, are not going to um, just um, lay back and give up their rights because they won't do that. They are, they'll keep fighting even though Israel will bomb or keep bombing and shooting, they will never stop fighting. And I really hope um, things can go back the, or where they were years ago. Okay. It, it, I think it's really important to point out that um, there, there's an awful lot of research in political science and history that, that demonstrates that, um, that what is called terrorism, resistance, which right. is sometimes resistance of uh, the less powerful against the powerful is often labeled as terrorism, right? You, you can have terrorism on the part of the powerful by, huh. by states. Obviously, it never gets labeled that, but then any resistance that's generated often gets labeled terrorism. But, but it's very clear. There's Robert Pape is the political scientist over at the University of Chicago, and he has the largest uh, database on what the suicide bombings as one particular form of what is called terrorism. And his main conclusion after, I mean, this is a heavy statistical analysis, what causes suicide bombings, what causes that particular form of resistance and terrorism? The answer that emerges very clearly in his data, it is uh, illegal occupation. Illegal occupation generates that kind of resistance, that kind of violence. It's the single cause. And wow. it doesn't matter what part of the world we're talking about. It, it could be you know, anywhere in the world. Uh, but when we see this form of uh, resistance uh, emerging, it's almost always related to an illegal foreign occupation. And so, yes, this occupation, uh, this illegal occupation, has generated various forms of resistance. Uh, and the intentata, there have been several intentatas as they were labeled, right? One of them started the day that I arrived in Israel, by the way. I, I didn't take responsibility, but. The day that I arrived in 2000, in September of 2000, was the day that Ariel Sharon went into Old Jerusalem, went to uh, uh, the Al Asqa Mosque, uh, or and near the, the ah. mosque. And, and started the second intifada. Started yes. the second intifada. Yeah. So that's why the time that I was there was so sort of touch and go. Why, the, you know, because things really started to heat up. I, I thought I was going at a time when things were pretty stable, and as it turned out to be a rather unstable time. But that resistance gets generated. Now, again, that resistance can sometimes take forms which many people have uh, moral qualms about, right? Because it often, I mean, the, the fact is that uh, the, the Hamas right now robbing their homemade makeshift bombs into Israel is targeting Israeli citizens. This is also a war crime under international law. And uh, again, I think those of us that are, are, are pacifists uh, deplore the use of violence as a way of resistance. Uh, but again, I want to make 
well, the p larger point I want to make is that the resistance, even if we don't approve of it, uh, in, in particular violent forms, is understandable as yeah. a reaction to occupation. And then uh, the occupying power responds with an overwhelming amount of force to respond to the resistance. And so. And that is state terrorism then. And that is what uh, you know, certainly many people would call state terrorism. And so let's get back to the current situation. So you outlined the, the, the immediate situation that led up to the current conflict. And of course, Hamas's response was to once again start launching their homemade makeshift, makeshift uh, rockets into uh, Israel, uh, which haven't done a whole lot of damage. They're, they're created, but, but nonetheless, they're they, they are an instrument of terror, of, of resistance, and they, they do, uh, they, this has caused Israel to respond. Now the Israeli response, uh, this is where again international law comes back into play, because the Israeli response in terms of attacking Gaza has been, uh, all has also taken forms which are clearly illegal under international law. You cannot use military force which is indiscriminate, which is disproportionate to any kind of military objective that deliberately targets civilians. Uh, and yet that's exactly what's been yes. happening with the Israeli yeah. response. And so again, I want to make clear that these are war crimes that are being committed now by the Israeli government in its attack on Gaza because it is, and how many civilians have been killed? Well, so far around 700, but the injuries have been close to 4,000. Uh, I have to add a point here for the uh, for Israel to um, to uh, to claim or to uh, they have to join the international uh, the ICC, the International, uh, criminal, international Court. criminal Court, and for that they have to sign on the. Rome Convention and for the Palestinian Authority as the legal authority representing the Palestinians have to sign on on that. They have been actually threatened by the U.S. of cutting off funds if they do join those international organizations that would entitle them to go and charge Israel with war crimes. If, uh, and they are the only ones they can do that. I mean, nobody can ask, I mean, it, for Israel to be tried unless the Palestinian Authority does that. They have to sign on on that. They have to sign on on the Rome uh, Convention, and they have been very hesitant to do that because of a fear of uh, the con the, uh, cutting of their funds from the United States and the European Union. So that's the first step. Now, going back, what does the, the resistance in Israel right now? If you remember the prisoner exchange when Shalit, the Israeli soldier, was kidnapped in 2009, the prisoner exchange was one for a thousand. He was released, Hamas, well, thousand of, I think, Hamas uh, sympathizers or fighters yeah. uh, were. Now, under this uh, uh, outbreak of violence, all of these prisoners were taken back. All the ones that were released in the prisoner exchange are back. And one of Hamas's demands right now is ending of blockade and releasing those prisoners. You know, Hamas and the Palestinian people are not willing to go back to pre-war, to the preconditions, because it's going to be more misery for the people on Gaza. Remember, this is a war on the people of Gaza, not on Hamas or any of the other factions. The, the, the humanitarian conditions cannot go back to the way it was, so the blockade and Israel took advantage of the weakness of the Arab regimes and the lack of support the Palestinians have. We thought after the Arab Spring, there will be more revival of the unity behind and the support for the Palestinian cause. Sadly, every Arab country has been ha having its own internal problems. And Egypt, this last government of Egypt, because they are against the Brotherhood, the Islamic Brotherhood, and Hamas is the Islamic chapter of the Brotherhood, so uh, Egypt, who, which has the only uh, crossing into Gaza, Rafah crossing, it has closed that and dismantled most of the tunnels that start, that bring those humanitarian food and conditions. So it is a very complicated story. But the end of this, uh, the Hamas is still going on even with more casualties and the people supported everywhere that without 
lifting the blockade and the prison re prisoners release, they are not going to accept any ceasefire. The ceasefire that was op uh, offered by Egypt did not offer ending the blockade. They said, we will discuss that later. And later is not going to work because in 2012, it was part of the agreement and Israel reneged and did not implement the part where the blockade should end. And for the crossings into Israel, not necessarily you know, uh, open, but the Rafah uh, crossing, which is the only exit for Gaza and the 1.8 million people into the world and for exports. And they cannot export their goods. Gaza has been completely devastated. Yeah, I don't, I don't think people understand how isolated and hemmed in Gaza is. Uh, there's no escape. No. Th no. There's, there's no, I mean, Open with, air prison. with the Israeli assault, there's nowhere to go. There's, there's no, you know, there aren't, I mean, and in fact, when people are in their homes, they, those homes can be deemed by the Israeli military as legitimate targets because they say, well, Hamas is hiding. They're using human shields. They're hiding in certain homes or they have some of these rockets in those homes and therefore they're claiming that those are legitimate military targets. They're not. That's, that's illegal under international law to deliberately target civilian homes in, the, in that manner. But that's the way in which the Israeli government is attempting to justify and provide some thin veneer of le legal legitimacy to some of the assaults that they're undertaking. But the larger point is, uh, in terms of international law, that this is a form of collective punishment, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is which is absolutely prohibited. And so even if Hamas is doing things that violate international law, and I think that they are on some occasions as part of their resistance, yeah. uh, the Israeli government cannot now punish all of the people of the Gaza Strip because of the actions of some Hamas militants. That is a form of collective punishment. Again, strictly prohibited under international law. So you can't go in and assault everyone in the Gaza Strip, which is essentially what's happening, uh, and claim that this is a legitimate military target. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. You can't impose collective punishment on a group right. of people for the actions of a few people who might be uh, within that particular territory. So I wanted to make that clear from, again, this is just from an objective international law perspective. Uh, you know, Amnesty International, any human rights organization, the United Nations, all would declare that this is a, a violation of the Geneva Convention, of Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, to impose collective punishment on a, on a population like Israel is doing right now. And the way that's carried out, the indiscriminate nature of the killing. I mean, the number of children that have been killed, and some of the stories that have come out about children being beheaded, children cutting in, cut in half so that a father trying to get his, his child has to go to two different hospitals mm. because his child was cut in half. Mm. I mean, it, it just cuts you to your heart. The entire buildings have been demolished with F-16 with people inside, entire families, and they are hitting ambulances, so the ambulances cannot get to them, uh, hospitals, uh, schools, schools, humanitarian, mosques. everything. But my point to go back to the issue is, what is the solution if United States continues to play the dishonest broker in this conflict? I mean, this is the only country that has leverage to tell Israel, stop, and we're not doing this, because we all know the, the power of the Israeli lobby, the AIPAC. And I hope everybody would read the book, The Lobby, by Mersheimer and Bolt, which says that the hold the hold that the Israeli lobby has on our government and on Congress is detriment to the United States interests in the region and in the world. So we have to really uh, talk, please, uh, write to our, our representatives and our government to be the honest broker in this conflict. Yeah, I mean, I am so angry about the response of our president yes. and our Senate who justify what Israel is doing, giving them a pass, saying, well, they have to defend themselves without any kind of consideration of the proportion, of the indiscriminate nature of the killing, of the, his, the whole context, the historical context that you have presented so well. It is very disappointing. And, um, you know, we can all contact them. I mean, I know I've called the offices of our senators, of our congressmen, of the president, and everyone needs to do that. I have been impressed 
that a number of Jewish people in this country are speaking out. Um, and yesterday, um, there was in New York, there was a, a group of Jewish people that went to um, an organization that supports the de Israeli Defense Organization and occupied their building and spoke out and said, as Jewish people, we say, not in our name. I was impressed um, with Gideon Levy, um, the Israeli writer for Haaretz, one of the probably the major um, Israeli newspaper, who said, this is inhumane, it's a violation of international law, and it's stupid. It will never bring us any closer to peace. So, and, and there have been demonstrations among the Israeli uh, Jewish people who are saying, we don't want this in our name, we want this to stop. But they've been attacked. Some of those people have been attacked, and Gideon Levy said that um, now, he has been forced to accept a bodyguard yes. when he walks around the streets. So much for the great democracy and freedom of speech that the Israelis proclaim they are. Ilan Pate had to resign his position at Haifa University and move, and he teaches in England. Uh, again, because he, there were threats on his life for his outspoken, you know, he's the one who wrote The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He is one of the new historians that are really defying the myth of Israel that have, they have been taught as children. They grow up as historians, professors, and they look at the archives, and they look at the Israeli, and they started realizing the crime in 1948 and the multiple massacres that drove those refugees and ended up in the creation of the State of Israel. By the way, 80% of the population in Gaza are refugees that have been expelled from historic Palestine in 1948. And we have to take that into consideration. I mean, the, the, the level of their misery. Yeah, I, I think it is important to, to point out that there are a uh, number of important uh, Israeli groups and organizations that protest their, their government's policy, that, uh, that advocate for uh, a just peace, for, uh, for you know, responding to war crimes and enforcing human rights. Uh, and, and just as many peace and justice organizations and groups in the United States are attacked and marginalized, uh, called unpatriotic, un-American, uh, the same thing happens to, to those uh, Israeli voices for peace. But they're there and they're quite strong. Uh, and I think it's very important to, to recognize them, but also to point out that, uh, that they're increasingly marginalized. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it, you know, in my long time of studying state crime, uh, that's, that's always what happens, you know, because you're not talking about the government, you're talking about the state uh, committing crimes, engaging right. in atrocities, and uh, there are people that don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear right. about their own government yeah. committing uh, these kinds of criminal acts, and they, they feel that because of nationalism and patriotism or uh, the ties of religion or ethnicity, they have to support, right? My government, right or wrong? Well, no, that's, uh, to me, that's the wrong exactly. attitude. You, if your government not. is wrong, then you have to try to make it right. Yeah. You can't say my government, right or wrong, and, and, yeah. and, and cover up or, or you know, advocate what your government's doing when they're violating the law, particularly when they're engaged in such wholesale violations of international law and violations of human rights as is what's happening. And by the way, mentioning the International Criminal Court, it's I want to make clear the United States has not signed the Rome Statute. The United States mm -hmm. is not a participant in the International Criminal Court because we say there's no way we would ever allow for the International Criminal Court to do anything <laughs> about, about U.S. military actions. And it's almost like the United States, which helped to create international law. I mean, I want to point out that at the end of World War II, it was the United States and Great Britain that led the advance with the Atlantic Charter, that led to the U.N. Charter, uh, and, and the modern basis for international law, except then we turn around and say, well, that doesn't apply to us. Right. International law applies to everybody else yeah. in the world. Exception. But, but, but somehow we're, we're an exception. And uh, because of our support of Israel, Israel is, is granted the same kind of exception from being held accountable under international law. Right. And, the, and the other problem with international law, therefore, is that the enforcement mechanisms yeah. are completely ineffectual, right? The international law is strong in the sense that it sets out a set of standards, right? 
human rights standards and, and particular laws governing the actions of states, but at the same time then the enforcement mechanism is simply not there. So it's, it's good to be able to say, well, that's a violation of human rights under international law, but then what are you going to do about it? And yeah. there is very little but to do about it. They do care about their image, though. And yes. I think the international image is really important. Then. And the freedom to travel. That's because, right. Because if they have been charged, if the Palestinians will go to the court and charge them with that crime, then they only can fly straight to the United States. They're, they cannot be flying their leaderships, the ones who are responsible right. for these massacres now and before. They will not be able to fly into any other country. Very important. I, I, I think that one of the things that has really jarred me is the, the, uh, the discrepancy between the way the mainstream press is uh, presenting this and talking to people who are on the ground and, and other viewpoints about what is really happening here. Um, and the, the mainstream press's complete embrace of Israel. I mean, we had the story of the NBC reporter who was removed from Gaza when he witnessed the killing of the four kids, on nine the to 11 years old, reported on that, he was withdrawn. They were forced to send him back. Yes. But I think just yesterday, a Palestinian woman on MSNBC, a commentator, and I can't recall her name right now, she spoke out on the air about the, um, the, the imbalance in the presentations. And she was on Amy Goodman's show this morning, and she said that all her future appearances on MSNBC have been canceled. Oh. So there's retaliation. Mm -hmm. If you try to speak out and say, hey, what's the story? And Nora, I'm wondering, I don't know if you've had a chance to read a lot of the American papers since you've been here. And, and if, if you've been able to notice a difference between the way um, things that happen in Israel and, and in Palestine are reported here and in your home. Have you been able to do any of that? Um, well, I haven't uh, read newspapers, but I've seen that the way um, people here express their feelings or their, their opinions, that they uh, go to protests holding the signs, and that's how they send their message, or they um, write about what they're feeling. Um, in Palestine or Israel, what it's doing is that it's sending a wrong message to the world about Palestinians. And then the, um, in the end, that's, that's not true, and it's just bombing and shooting on Palestinian lands. Okay, okay, so there's a real discrepancy between what... I think the, na the narrative that the American people are hearing through the press is so different from what is actually happening on the ground. It's, it's very disappointing. Uh, one more thing I'd like to add quickly. We're talking about the violence of the military, the Israeli military. We're not talking about the violence of the settlers against the people in the West Bank. That's a daily occurrence in every village, in every street. Uh, and I mean, something we witness on a daily basis when you are there, and they are protected by the Israeli army. They get away with murder, literally. And uh, they're getting very emboldened because of the support they have from here and for the protection of their, their army. One of the things I think that we have to, I don't know how much time we got left. About five minutes left. Five minutes. <laughs> this is not an issue where American people can say, this is not my business, That's them. let them fight it out, because we're deeply implicated in this whole thing. Our government supports the Israeli uh, military, we support their government. We protect them internationally all the time. The United States is deeply implicated in all this. And so we as citizens of this country have a responsibility to speak out. Yes. And that is what has not happened here. And I think it hasn't happened because American people don't know the situation, don't know the story. But here's an opportunity to speak out and say, not in our name, not in our name. As, as with many issues, the, the larger historical context and the larger political context is not uh, presented. Yeah. It's not discussed. I mean, that's, that's one of the key failings of our mainstream media. They, uh, you know, it's all sound bites. It's all, you know, it, it's all acceptance of the governmental perspective and the conventional wisdom, and they don't do any independent research. They don't provide that historical and political context that is so necessary to understand what's really going on. 
and we see that with so many issues. Oh, yeah. It's not just yeah. this particular issue, but uh, any issue that has to do with U.S. foreign policy, I think, falls in, into that category. Again, the hold of the Israeli lobby on Congress, yes. on the media, on the president, and everything explains all this one-sided policy and the media uh, bias against the truth, actually. They cover up all the crimes. Right. And uh, another book that's very important that uh, Paul Findlay, an ex-senator of Illinois, wrote to us called They Dared to Speak Out. Yeah. And that's the method the lobby follows in actually uh, blackmailing and threatening the Congress to vote their way in every, every uh, Senate act or law. All right, we just have a couple of minutes left. so. As we're taping this program today, John Kerry's uh, heading up to Ramallah. And so what would be the best outcome uh, from your perspective in terms of Kerry's visit, even okay. understanding the limitations okay. of the I US think Israel wants position? out. Israel wants an end because I think they're implicated in something. They didn't expect the resistance in Gaza to hold steadfast like this. They thought, you know, if they hit them hard, cause enough casualties, civilians, and they, they will just, you know, uh, surrender. Now, there, there, is a, there has to be a face-saving way that he has to somehow um, engineer to get Israel out of this dilemma because the Palestinians are standing steadfast, end of the blockade, release of those prisoners that you re-imprisoned after that. And now the Palestinians have an Israeli hostage, one soldier that they took which probably will be a new prisoner exchange. There are at least 10 to 12,000 Palestinians in Israeli jails. Mm -hmm. These, nobody speaks about those. They're not part of the demands of this uh, deal. Mm -hmm. So the, I think ending the blockade and letting the Gaza people live as human beings is, is gonna be a big achievement. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we are out of time. Uh, Shadia, I wanna thank, thank you, you for thank providing you. that important perspective. Norm, uh, glad to have you on the program. Good luck going back to uh, eighth grade, right? Uh, back in uh, the West Bank. And uh, uh, Don, good to talk with you Thanks, again. Sir. And I hope we've provided some perspective, as we say, all critical issues. This is one of the most critical issues, alternative perspective. We certainly presented a very alternative perspective today on, on this, uh, on this mm -hmm. particular thank situation. Thank you for having so us. Thank, thank, you. thank you for being here, and thank you for joining us. And we'll see you again on Critical Issues, Alternative Views.